So the best thing you can do is to sandwich it between preferred activities. So preferred activity, and then you're going to go to your teletherapy, you know, appointment and make it fun. Don't make it sound like a chore. Like we get to do this. And as soon as we're finished, then we get to do this other really fun thing and make sure it's always something that she looks forward to doing. Um, that may help a bit. And then as long as the speech therapist knows, usually they're pretty good about finding games or things that she'll be interested in. So maybe talk about some of your daughter's interests um, so that the speech person can incorporate some of that in the games that they play with her. That might really help. I know the teletherapy appointments are really, really difficult for kids, especially if she's just two. That could be really hard. Um, my initial thought is figure out why. Um, if you don't know the why behind the behavior, then you have some, some observing to do or a discussion to have. Um, is it, you know, a lack of interest? Is it because, you know, they feel like they don't have the skill they need? Is it because they don't enjoy it? You know, figure out what the why is to figure out if it's worth, you know, building that skill or not. Because you don't want your child to be doing something that they actually really dislike. Um, but if it's just because they're not confident in their abilities, then you could talk about how practice makes you better and things like that and make it a fun game. Uh, if they have, if they're just practicing in your home, maybe you could make the practice sessions smaller in time frame. Uh, so maybe it's five minutes. That way it's not such a daunting task, especially if it sounds like it's something that's a non-preferred activity. And then just like I suggested to Lori, if it's a non-preferred activity, you're going to sandwich it in between preferred activities to make sure they have something to look forward to. So you can say something like, you know, the sooner we get done with the violin practice, then the sooner we move on to that preferred activity that they love doing. Uh, so you have to figure out why it's happening. Is it because she's frustrated? Is it because she's not getting her way? Things like that. And then you have to think of it like a skill that needs to be taught. So you need to stay calm because the second you lose your calm or your composure, the opportunity to teach the missing skill or the replacement skill is gone. Um, so if you, you know, have an outburst and you're really upset, then your child's also going to be upset and you're both going to escalate each other. Um, so you want to stay calm and then figure out why it's happening so that you can work through that feeling. Is it frustration? Is it because she's not getting what she wants? Is it, you know, is it a lack of communication? Um, things like that. Because if it's communication, then you can incorporate smaller phrases or incorporate sign language. But if it's out of frustration for not getting what she's wanting, then you can talk about how to work through that feeling of frustration. Because it's okay to be frustrated, but it's not okay to be hurtful. Um, and you can say things like, you're safe and I'm here for you. It's my job to keep you safe. It's okay to be mad or frustrated. It's okay to be mad. It's not okay to hurt. Um, and just make sure you're framing it positively because the more attention you give to something, the more often it's going to happen. So you're going to avoid things like saying no hitting because that's only telling her what not to do. And for kiddos, you need to tell them what you do want and what you do expect. So you'll say things like we use gentle hands um, and then show what you mean. So like this things like that. It looks like you're mad. If you need something to squeeze, here's a pillow. You can squeeze a pillow. You may not hit. Hitting hurts. We use gentle hands. And just make it that repetitive kind of language. You definitely have to know why it's happening to be able to be effective. Yeah, that's going to be a thing for sure. For a lot of children, it might be hard for them. If they're used to just being in their household, it will be very difficult for them, but not impossible. Remember, kids are really resilient, and it just means that we're going to have to take some extra time to teach social and emotional skills, because that is what is going to be lacking. Uh, short answer, no. I don't think it's enough when children say things like that, because school counselors are so, so talented, but they're spread really thin. Uh, so I would look at some outside counseling, maybe some play-based therapy would be really, really beneficial. Um, and sometimes that involves family and sometimes they do it just with the child and a counselor and it's all play-based, which sometimes gets you some more answers to the why behind that feeling of life not being worth it. But the moment things start um, shifting to that, you know, not wanting to live, um, school counseling is not enough. I would definitely look into some other options 
as soon as possible if you are able to do that. To start, I don't believe in punishment and rewards. I believe in um, being a conscious parent and implementing discipline and having a routine. I actually just posted before I went live, I posted a part one and two of morning routines. I think routines are very beneficial. However, I also think that you need to implement the power of choice. So you can offer two choices throughout the routine. So your routine may have some picture cards if your child's five or under, because if they can't read, then the routine's useless um, if it doesn't have pictures. So you're gonna have a picture routine in place. I call it a visual schedule or a visual routine. Um, and it's gonna say exactly what to do and the order to do it. However, there's some wiggle room in there because your child needs to feel powerful and in control of parts of their life also, or you're going to get a lot of pushback. So, and I also think um, that you shouldn't have a lot of decision making in the morning. Like it shouldn't be picking out your clothes and stuff like that. That should already be done. It's just a matter of putting the clothes on. Um, or like how you want your hair done if, if you have someone with long hair. Um, that should be decided the night before and they should be part of that decision. So you're going to control the choices. So do you want these pants or these pants, right? And then they get to choose from those options um, so that they have control, but you are controlling the choices they get, right? Um, so do I believe in punishment reward? No, um, because I don't think that children should do something to get something else that's external outside of themselves. I think that they should do it because they know it's the right thing to do and it's what's expected of them. To get to that point can be difficult though. Um, and to avoid power struggles within that process is also difficult, which is why I use the power of two choices. Um, so that might look like, you know, it's time to wake up. I'll set a five minute timer. You can choose to get up on your own or when the timer goes off, I will help you out of bed. Then once they're out of bed, I'm going to offer two more choices because sometimes for certain kids, mornings are really tough. So then I can say, look, your clothes are here and your toothbrush is ready with toothpaste in the bathroom. You can choose to get dressed first or you can choose to brush your teeth first. Either way, both things are getting done next. So they might choose to brush their teeth and then they don't want to get dressed. Oh, I see that you're having a tough time getting dressed. I'll set the timer for you and you can choose to get dressed on your own. Or when the timer beeps, I'll put your, your clothes in your backpack and you can go to, dress, go to school dressed in pajamas or you can choose to get dressed. And that's called a natural consequence. So it's directly related to their choice or lack of deciding, right? So they picked out their clothes and most likely they're not going to do that again. But you do have to follow through. Because usually that means you're going to get to the car and your child's going to say, no, no, I'm not going to school in my pajamas. Mm, well, I hear that you don't want to go in your pajamas. Remember, you chose not to get dressed. So you chose to get to school in your pajamas. Don't worry, I packed your clothes in your bag and you can change when you get there if you want to. Um, and usually that natural consequence, notice my tone wasn't and I told you so, it wasn't like... Oh, that's embarrassing. I wasn't demeaning them in any way. I'm just saying you made a choice. This is the result. You made the choice. Here it is. Tomorrow, you can choose to get dressed. It's up to you or not, and then we can do this again. No big deal. Um, so that it's a teachable moment for them. Um, so the follow through is the hardest part. But I do believe in a get ready for school routine. But I also believe that your child deserves some choices within that. And I also allow like an extra at least 10 or 15 minutes for the first week that I put in place a routine because you're going to get pushed back. So make sure you allow for that because um, if you're running late, that's not your child's fault. So your stress shouldn't come out onto them, even though sometimes it does and we're human, um, but try to account for that time, the extra time that it may take. Uh, well, I guess that depends on how soon you're planning on doing that. Um, I would say have at least a week before and start putting in place more of a routine of what the school day may look like. Make sure their wake up times and bedtimes are aligned with school and you can do that in like 10 minute increments every single day to work up to where you need to be so that it's not so alarming because otherwise you're not setting your child up for success for that school time frame. Um, make sure that when they're at grandma's that there's a lot of play happening and grandma can, you know, pretend 
and you can work through trading, taking turns, things like that that might come up um, with peer-to-peer -peer conflicts that are going to happen at school. Um, other than that, there's not a whole lot. You could maybe prep your two-year-old for what that morning will look like and that you'll always come back to get them from school or that grandma will be there, you know, make sure you prepare them for what to expect because usually that nervousness and anxiousness is just about not knowing. Even if you could go there and visit, say this is the building, this is what it looks like, that's the door will go in, um, things like that to really prepare them to take away some of that nervousness. That might also really help. And then make your goodbyes short, like minute, a minute or so. Um, give a hug. I love you so much. Remember, I'm going to come back and get you or whoever is going to come back so they know what to expect. Um, you could even leave them with something of yours so that they can kind of hang on to it for that first week or so if separation is a problem. And then don't elongate it. Don't look backwards. Don't say sorry. Things like that because um, that's just going to make it harder for them to bounce back and have a successful day. The quicker it is, they're going to miss you, but within five minutes, typically, five to ten, they're okay. Um, and then you can ask the daycare provider or whoever, the school that you're sending them to, you can ask them to send you a text update or a picture once your child calms down. That's an amazing question. And two to four is right around the age that kids are going to test that boundary. They want to know what, what will happen because, you know, all of us, we want certain things. It doesn't mean we can have that. But we're always going to question if we do something, will it work? Um, so you want to be consistent. And I also would say try to avoid using the word no. You're going to frame it positively. So for example, if it's no candy, then you're going to say, right now our choices for snacks are, and you can give two choices. If they don't want that, and they might, they might say, well, I want candy. I hear you want candy. Right now our choices for snack are this or that. You can choose to have those or we can go play somewhere else. Sometimes your two-year-old's going to cry, throw a fit, drop themselves to the floor right there. And you can just say, I can see this is hard for you. And then say nothing. You can just make eye contact and start breathing slowly with them. Um, if they don't breathe with you, that's okay. Just make sure you are calm because um, it won't work if you're not calm. And then once they start calming down a bit, then you can say, um, oh, it looks like you're feeling a little bit better. Do you need a hug? And I wouldn't address the candy anymore. If they say it again, you can say, remember, we said these are your two snack choices, or we can go play with whatever, Legos, Play-Doh, something. And if they still do it and, you know, throw that fit, you can say something along the lines of, I gave you your choices. You can choose to have a snack, this or that, or you can choose to go play with Play-Doh. You can choose, or I can help you choose. And what that means is, if they decide that they're not going to choose, then you are helping them by choosing for them. You don't have to say that, you just say, oh, it looks like you need help choosing, let's go play with Play-Doh. Um, and that's typically how I do things. I frame it positively. If it's no running, no hitting, it's gonna be, we use gentle hands. We use walking feet. Look, let me show you what that looks like. You're running. If you would like to run, we're going outside in 10 minutes or whatever. Tell them when you can go outside and run. Um, but inside, we use walking feet. But never once do I have to say no running. You want to paint a picture for your child with your words and then maybe show them if you can with your body or model it for them, show them. Um, so that they really have a picture in their head of what they are expected to do. Um, because children need to know what to do in order to be successful. If you only tell them what not to do, they don't really have a picture in their head of what they should do. If you say no running, really that's not very clear. It could mean you can walk, it could mean you can skip, it could mean you can hop, it could mean you can shuffle, you can dance. You know, what does that mean? It means we're going to use safe walking feet inside our house. Let me show you. Or, you know, it could be about yelling. And instead of no, le no yelling or you're too loud, it could be, oh, I see you're yelling. Inside, we use a talking voice. Inside voice is too general still because what is an inside voice actually for a child who doesn't know? 
inside, they're yelling, so that is their inside voice. They are inside and that is the voice they're using, right? So I use talking voice. So I say, inside we use our talking voice, match your voice to mine. And usually that works. Sometimes I have to give them a phrase. And then I say, match your voice to mine, say, hello. And then they repeat, hello. I say, oh, you used your talking voice. It looks like you're ready to try it on your own now. And then we just leave it. And sometimes they need a couple more reminders. But that's what I would do. And then just make sure you're consistent. So it could be if you choose to keep running, then you're choosing to go outside or then you're choosing to take a break with me and take some deep breaths because your body's not safe, um, things like that. So they made a choice. Here is the natural consequence. It has to be directly related to what they did or are doing. It can't be something like, oh, you chose to keep running, so now this toy's gone. That doesn't make sense. You want it to make sense and be related to the incident that's happening. If you can't relate it to the incident, then just continue giving those reminders and positive phrases. And I always offer a break too. It looks like your body's unsafe. I have reminded you, do you maybe need a break? I can go with you. And it's not a timeout, it's very different. It's, it looks like your body's unsafe. Do you wanna take a break together, read a book, calm our bodies so we can restart? Um, so that you're using it as a tool because everyone needs a break sometimes. So sometimes that's what I offer as well. Just because they're testing boundaries. They want to know if I do this, then I will get blank every time. So if I yell and throw a fit, will it get me what I was hoping for? If the answer is sometimes, then they're going to try it all the time. Uh, I use this example today with uh, one of the parents I work with. I said, you know, think about it this way as an adult. If we're short on cash in our bank account, we're still going to try the debit card if we need gas, right? If we have no other means to pay, we're still going to try it. Even if we think there's not enough there, we're going to try it because sometimes it might work, right? And then sometimes it might get declined and then we're still going to be upset about that because we wanted the gas in our car. But sometimes it works and then we know that sometimes trying the debit card works. It's the same with behavior. So if you're not consistent, then you're part of the problem. And you're teaching your child that when they do that, it helps them get what they were hoping for. Because behavior is communication. Um, so you're gonna offer two positive choices that are related to the um, incident. Um, so for example, I don't wanna brush my teeth. I hear you don't wanna brush your teeth. Right now, this is what we're doing. You can choose the red toothbrush or the blue toothbrush. You can choose or I can help you choose. Those are all two choices. Or I hear that this is hard for you. The sooner we get done, the sooner we move on to reading a story. And I know you love reading stories. Um, that's also two choices. Or it could be, you know, a choice of how to move to get to the next location. It could be, I hear that you really are not looking forward to this. Tell you what, we can race there or we can wiggle like a jellyfish all the way to the sink. Which one? You can pick or I can help you pick. And sometimes the first few times your child's going to say, I don't want either of those. You say, I hear you. These are the choices. You can pick or I can help you pick. Next time, you can pick the animal movements and then I can, you know, move with you. This time, these are the choices. You can pick or I can help you pick. And then sometimes I'll give them like a few seconds. Say, if you choose not to pick, then I'm going to help you and I'll pick one. And the most important part is the follow through because they're going to Say, well, I didn't want that one. I wanted the other one. I hear you. Next time, make sure you tell me. That way, I, I won't help you pick, and you can just say it and make your choice for yourself. This time, I helped you pick, and I chose moving like a jellyfish. And then you might have to, you know, wiggle their arms or something and make it a fun something. So I usually do animal movements because I can make them feel silly. And usually by the time we get there, the child is giggling a little bit or even, like, smiling but trying to not smile. And then I follow up with another two choices. So maybe we made it to the sink to brush teeth. And then maybe I have two toothbrushes there because I know this is a struggle every single day. So I'm going to give the illusion of choice. You can have a blue toothbrush or a red toothbrush. You can choose or I can help you choose. And then they're going to remember that last time I picked for them and they didn't like my choice. So this time they're more likely to choose. If you have a very persistent child, they might still say, I don't want to brush my teeth. I hear ya. Brushing your teeth is not fun to you. 
You can choose your toothbrush or I can help you choose. The sooner we get done, the sooner we get to go downstairs and play or whatever. Um, so it helps to give two choices. Just make sure it's related. Or maybe you have two toothpastes. And whenever there's a refusal and I have to help choose, I try to come up with another two choices right afterwards. And if I can't, because sometimes, honestly, it, it can be tiring to come up with two choices all the time. So if it's been a long day and, and they ended up doing the activity and we're finished, then I just celebrate. I don't say, wow, finally. I'm like, look at that, we did it and now we're done and we get to move on. Woo, do you want a high five? Do you want a hug? We did it, we, do, we use teamwork. You know, even though your child didn't really want to be there and didn't want the help, they still did the task and they got your help through it. So I frame it positively and say, wow, we did that together. We used teamwork, look at us go. And then we move on so that I'm not setting us up for another negative situation for the next activity or task that we have to get done. Um, but you can really offer any two positive choices. It could be, I see you don't wanna put your shoes on. These are the shoes we need to wear today because of the weather. Do you wanna put your right shoe on first or your left shoe on? Or do you wanna put on your coat first or your hat first? So the choice wasn't, do you wanna get dressed? And it's not, can you put your coat on? Because that's asking them if it's okay and it's not a choice. Um, but I'm just saying, which one do you wanna do first? Or if you're just doing a short distance like to the car, you could say you can choose to put your coat on now or we can get in the car like this and we'll bring the coat. That way you're avoiding that power struggle as much as possible and you're offering some control. Um, my first question would be, what's he doing while he's tuning you out? Is it at all points in the day? Is it when he's playing with something that he's really enjoying? Is it when he's looking at electronics? You know, whether it's a tablet, a TV, anything. Because um, my first instinct would be, you know, have an attention getter say his name, move in front of his body, grasp his eye contact somehow, you know, even if it needs to be right away. Um, sometimes I've said like, oh, hi, Joey, I see you. You know, and I'm not right up in his face, but I'm blocking that eye contact wherever his eyes were looking. I am now it, I am there. Um, and then I'll say, oh, it looks like you were really enjoying that. I just have something real quick to say. Um, and my second thing would be, if you wanna ask a simple question, is it something that is a direction and you're telling your child to do something or is it actually a question that is a yes or no and that would be acceptable? Um, Cause make sure that your questions are actually choices that are optional. If it's not optional, then it, sh it shouldn't be a question. It should be framed as either two positive choices or as a direct direction. Um, so it wouldn't be, can you go wash your hands? It would be, it's time to go wash your hands. Do you wanna walk there or tiptoe there? And then if they're still tuning you out, then you can lock eyes, you know? Oh, it looks like maybe you didn't hear me. You seemed really focused on what you were doing. Because remember, kiddos are people too. So your child just might really be focused in on something. Like if we're really focused in on a work task and someone comes in to an office or our space and interrupt, sometimes it is hard to shift our mindset from the task we were doing to that other person. So keep that in mind. Your child may not just, they may not know how to do that um, effectively yet. So keep that in mind and try to stay calm. There's no such thing as good and bad kids. There are helpful and hurtful choices and kids that need more skills and more practice. Um, you control what is offered to eat. Your child chooses whether or not to eat the food. Um, you can always offer that same option later and I would always make sure there's at least one thing, like a core element on the plate um, with nutritional value that you know your child will eat and everything else that's there, you know, incorporate new items that they've never seen before in very small amounts. Um, but remember, you control what is offered for meals. They control whether or not they choose to eat it. Um, and just make sure your meal times aren't strict. Like they can choose to eat it a half hour later. You can warm it back up for them, but that is their choice. Okay, so that means that he has a problem with self-regulation. Um, and I say problem just meaning he lacks the skills he needs so far. 
Um, think of it just like you would any other school subject. Social skills are also difficult for some children to learn. So when he gets really excited, that could be the equivalent in his body, like it feels uncontrollable the same way that anger or rage feels in other children. So we just have to teach him how to calm. Uh, you're going to do this through teaching some fun ways to do deep belly breaths. There's a really fun Sesame Street video with Elmo about belly breathing. There's tons of picture cards online that you can use with fun, different ways to take a breath. There's like bumblebee breaths, flower breaths, um, smell the flower, blow the candles. There's tons and tons of them out there. Just find something that you think would interest your three-year-old because um, you're going to want to notice his body and say, oh, it looks like you're getting excited. Let's stop and take a breath. It's okay to be excited. It's not okay to be hurtful. It's okay to be excited. Let's take some deep breaths so we can stay excited and stay safe. Um, and then you're gonna talk about gentle hands while we're excited and what that looks like, how we can give hugs when we're excited and still be safe and still be helpful or kind. You know, whatever words feel the most natural to you, but make sure to frame it positively because all that means is your child lacks the skill. He doesn't know what to do with his body when he gets that excited about something and it makes him out of control. So we need to show him how to recognize that excited feeling before it gets out of control. That's a skill. And then also teach him to stop. This is the sign language for stop. So I say we stop and we take a deep breath. The more you can link a physical action to a phrase or a direction, the better off he will be at remembering it. So I always say, oh, it looks like you're getting really excited. You know, do whatever you want to do for excited. Um, you could say, remember, stop, take a deep breath. Do you need another one? Remember, it's okay to be excited. We have to be safe and excited. Take another deep breath. Here we go. And just make sure you're doing that with him. You're showing him how to calm. And then you can say, all right, it looks like you wanted to, to touch that person. Did you want to do a hug or a high five? Remember, it's okay to be excited. We have to be safe and gentle or safe and kind when we're excited. Something like that. Keep it very simple. I use things like uh, balloon breaths, cupcake breaths, smell the flower, blow out the candles. Um, there's a ton of stuff out there. There's like a thing called a windmill breath, a uh, bumblebee breath. There's a ton and there's like pictures that go with it to show the child how to do it. Um, and it ends up working out way more successfully than the counting to 10 thing. Um, and I try to incorporate their bodies too. So if you watch the Elmo video about belly breathing, they say to lay on your belly, put your hands on your belly, and you have to make your belly go up and down to move your fingers. So if they're interlocked, you'll feel them spreading apart as you take an actual belly breath. Because um, we have to teach children how to take a belly breath versus through your chest. Because um, when we do a breath like this, that's actually a stress response and it's not helping your body to de-escalate or calm down. It's only the ones that are through the diaphragm. Uh, so that's why we call them belly breaths. They're in through the nose, out through the mouth, and it's all about control. So it's slow inhaling, we hold, and then we slowly exhale. So when I do like smell the flower, oh, you love this smell. It smells so nice and it's relaxing. Let's take a really deep breath, smell it for as long as you can. Hold, 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 and blow on the petals or blow out the candles. Try to see how long you can blow the candles out because they're really far away. You know, or now the flower's really far away and we want to try to blow those petals. And the longer our breath lasts, the longer or the more chance we have of blowing them out. Um, something like that. So you want to make it fun. It's not a chore. It's something to help our body and it feels good. So once they get a little bit older, uh, make sure you can stay calm because if you yell back, it's not going to work out. You're not going to teach them anything and they're just going to continue escalating you and you're going to escalate them. So if they're arguing, you know, maybe they ask for something and you give a statement that it's not a choice right now or, you know, and you give them two positive choices of alternatives, something like that. And then they still continue. Well, why? Why? I hear you want to know why. I'll say it one more time. And like, just explain it like it's a fact. I hear you wanted this. These are the choices you have right now. I know that it's hard to not get something you were hoping for. 
maintain eye contact. You can say, you know, how can I help you through this? And sometimes at 10, they might get a little bit, you know, argumentative and say, well, you can give me what I want. Or, you know, it might come out like, I don't like you or, you know, some, some hurtful things. And just make sure you don't react and say, well, I hear you. If you want to talk about something else, I'm here for you. But this is asked and answered. And then they might say, well, why? Why? You already asked and I already gave you an answer. And then walk away or just don't respond anymore. That's one of my favorite phrases for older children. Um, once I've, you know, said it one to three times, um, I always make sure I restate, but if I've said it three times, especially three, if there's more than one child arguing about the same thing, I would give them three, three times of restating it calmly. And then it's just, you asked and I gave you an answer. If you would like to talk about something else, I'm here for you. I am done talking about this but then make sure you follow through on that and do not respond anymore to that subject. Um, that's the hard part because we have feelings too and we become escalated, frustrated, you know. Um, but if you say you're gonna do something, then do it. And then your child's gonna see that and be like, oh, I'm getting nowhere. Oh, I'm wasting my time. Yes, I'm frustrated, but now I'm wasting my time too. And usually it works. Um, you could create, if you have the time and the resources, a working board. Um, like some people create boards with like the latches and different things that your child can do that's safe for them to do. Because um, usually when that happens, it's because they want to be like you and they want to feel useful and helpful. So you can either create something where they can plug and unplug things. Like maybe it's an empty outlet cover on a wooden board or cardboard or something with one of those um, baby covers and they can place it in and take it out and this is what they're allowed to do. Um, and then you just say, you know, I see you've been, you know, looking at the, the outlets a lot. Here is one for you. You may use this, you may not touch those. If you choose to touch those, then you're choosing to take a break with me and read a story so we can talk about it. Um, I would also look into some social stories about it, um, about how outlets are not safe, things like that. Um, and it really talks about, um, social stories really build a skill and talk about that specific thing. Um, so I would Google uh, social stories about not touching outlets or something like that, or keeping kids away from outlets, or the danger of outlets that might be helpful as well. Um, and you can also make sure your son feels powerful and motivated and helpful by giving him ways to help you. Because that might be all it is, is wanting to do adult-like things. So you're gonna find some appropriate ways to do that. Maybe that's with cooking a meal. Maybe it's with fixing something with you that is appropriate, you know? Maybe it's about building something together. But make it seem like your child is more helpful on something that typically you would do by yourself because it's what adults do. Yes. Behavior is communication for our entire lives. It just gets harder to decipher as we get older because we create these coping mechanisms or um, put up walls and fronts for people if we're uncomfortable. But behavior is still absolutely communication. It just becomes harder to read as we get older because you have to really focus on tone, body language, sarcasm comes into play, uh, all of those things. But yes, our entire lives, behavior is communication, and it definitely can tell you something if you are able to observe and really try to dive into why it's happening. Um, I love behavior tracking as well. So with your kiddos, it's really nice because you can say, you know, okay, this behavior seems to be happening randomly, but then if you take a step back and just kind of watch when it happens, maybe it's the same time every day. So is it about being tired? You know, maybe it's with a certain person. So maybe that's a sibling, maybe that's, you know, someone else in their life, a friend, whatever. So maybe it's about conflict, right? Or effective communication. Maybe it's every time that they were redirected. So maybe it wasn't a strict no, but maybe it was, I was hoping for this and I did not get this and I was redirected somewhere else. Maybe it's about that. So really finding out the why behind the behavior sometimes kids can't exactly tell you why they did it which is hard even at nine they may not exactly know because sometimes feelings are very vague inside your body um, or the thought isn't fully processed but an action happened so like a behavior happened but maybe the full thought slash feeling wasn't 
really developed. They just kind of felt something and something impulsive happened. Give yourself some grace. It's okay to not be perfect. What you can do is help model for your child what that looks like. So when I make a mistake, this is what I can do. It's not that I'm beating myself up about it. It's that I made a mistake. I acknowledge it. Here's what I'm going to do to actively try to do better because no one's perfect. Um, so my first thing would be if your son thinks she's strict, that means that your rules and her rules or like expectations are not the same. First, you need to both be on the same page so that your son doesn't think that she's strict. It's just these are the rules. This is what we expect. If you choose to do this, then this is what's going to happen, whether it's your stepmom or me. Um, if it's about your household being more strict and the stepmom is just the one implementing those things, I would make it a point to make sure you're also implementing those things so that he doesn't feel attacked. Um, and then make sure that um, his stepmom is being very intentional with her tone of voice and her body language because if she comes off as being aggressive, then that's also a problem. Um, I have videos on tones of voice. Um, she's going to really want to make sure she's being calm and being assertive. Um, so any direction or statement or putting in place a consequence, it should sound like a fact. Her tone and her body language shouldn't be judgmental or accusatory. So it'll sound like a fact. Um, so the same as like, I'm doing a live video right now would sound the same as you chose not to eat your dinner. Your dinner is here for you later on when you want to have a snack. You can choose whether or not to eat, but this is your only choice right now. It should sound the same. So if she's elevating her voice or if she, you know, looks standoffish like this or something, that's where the judgment comes into play and where kids start to think that we're being mean. Even if we don't mean for it to be like that, that is how we're coming across. So just make sure you guys are on the same page, that the rules and expectations are the same across the board. Because um, it's okay if different households have different rules, because then you can say that. But you both have to be on the same page about what your expectations are or his feeling that she's too strict is not going to go away. And then she's going to want to make sure to find time to connect with him as far as, you know, finding moments to really positively notice him. And the amount of times that she positively notices him needs to far outweigh those consequence moments. So if he's having a really tough day, she better make sure she's noticing every small victory that he's making. And that doesn't mean she's giving him tons of crazy good jobs and good job, good job, good job, you're doing so great, and he's like not doing anything. Um, you want to be intentional. So, oh, I see you came in and you put your shoes right where they belong. Thank you so much for that. That helps me out a lot, or I really appreciate when you do that. And then just walk away. It doesn't have to be this big moment. Um, or it can be, oh, I noticed that you did what I asked the first time. I, that really makes my life a lot easier. I appreciate you. Something like that. Um, well, with treats and things like that, usually what I do is I just say, oh, I've been noticing, like we have a family meeting, I've been noticing some people in the house are wanting some extra snacks or treats. So now we're all going to plan our snacks for the day. Here are your choices. You can pick four, right? And maybe one of those is a treat like an actual treat item and the rest are snack type things that would be okay with you to choose. Maybe you have six of them as a choice out on the counter. Your child gets to pick four. So then at the end of the day, it's not we're sneaking in the pantry. It's, you know, look at your basket or your bag or whatever you put them in. These are the treats that, or these are the snacks, the items you chose. You can choose to eat these or you can choose to have nothing. It's up to you. Remember, you made this choice. Um, and then as far as addressing it, you could just hold a family meeting and say, you know, I noticed some things happening. Remember, the, the stuff in the pantry isn't a choice always. It's only a choice sometimes. And treats are a sometimes food. So if you would like a treat, then you need to ask for one. So at two years old, the level of like wait time they have is really about probably a minute or two before you'd have to, you know, keep stating things. So you want to be very specific about time. You're not going to say things like, wait a minute, or hold on a sec, 
because that's very general and it's not true most of the time. We mean wait a minute and we mean like five minutes or sometimes it's 10 and sometimes it's one. That's very unclear. So you're gonna use timers. Um, I like sand timers or time timers that you could get from Amazon, but sand timers you can get from the dollar store. Um, and they come in increments of one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, I believe. Um, and so it's a visual for them. If you don't wanna spend the money on anything, you can also use like your microwave timer or you know the timer on your phone or something. But I like the visual ones so that the child can actually go reference it when they need it, you know, if they're feeling anxious. Um, and because you're two year old, you want to build the patients. Right now, the patient's level is at like nothing, right? So at first, like for maybe a few days, the amount of wait time you expect should be about a minute or two minutes because you're building the skill. You're not gonna right away expect them to be able to wait five minutes because that's not attainable. You're not building the skill. You're setting them up for failure. Um, so you're gonna set the timer, say, look, I set the timer. First we wait, this is the sign language for wait. First we wait, then we can go do whatever they were hoping for um, and just be very specific. It's one minute. You have to wait one minute and then we can go. While you wait, here's what you can do. You can play with Legos or you can play with Play-Doh. So you're not just saying go play because sometimes even that, like they're still focused on what they were hoping for. So saying go play, all they're still thinking about is that thing they don't have. Um, or, you know, maybe it's about having time with you. So all they're still thinking about is that you're not playing with them. So be very specific and I give two positive choices. So, you know, wait, first go play by yourself. You can play Legos or play Play-Doh. Then when the timer beeps, then it'll be our time to play together. Um, and as far as being demanding, just make sure you're empathizing. I hear you. You want this. Right now, you can have this or that. I'll set a timer for when you can have the thing they were hoping for. If they're not responding to a direction, you're going to change the way you're giving the direction. So you're going to say it like it's two positive choices or maybe it's because you need to change your tone of voice. I have videos on tones of voice. Um, and composure, that might really help. I think it's called A Way to Better Your Parenting. And then toward the very bottom of my page, I think there's two videos on tones of voice. Because um, most of the time, that means that you're asking instead of telling. And, and or when you're telling, you're aggressive instead of assertive, which causes that pushback. Um, so there can be quite a few things happening there, but you really have to reflect. Um, everything that I kind of put out there is an adult first mindset. So you have to be aware that environment changes behavior and you are part of the environment. So to effectively change behavior, you have to change the environment or the way you are, you know, responding or giving direction. Once you change that, then the behavior will change because you cannot make someone change. You can only change the environment to allow for change because you can't make anyone do anything without their permission. You just can't. Um, power doesn't come from force, it comes from choice. So if they're not listening, you're gonna change the way you're framing your directions. It's not, it's time to go wash your hands, um, okay? Because okay is a question. Is it okay to wash your hands? And your child has the option to say yes or no at that point, where if you say, it's time to wash your hands. Do you want to walk there or tiptoe there? The option to wash hands isn't there. It's just how are we getting there? Or it's do you want to wash by yourself or do you want help? You know, the options you give are up to you. The only thing that's important to note is that it's not a trick. It's not that one choice is better um, when you're giving a direction. It's both choices are okay. Both are going to bring you success. You can choose or I can help you choose. Okay, so there's kind of a lot to unpack. So take a deep breath. I am going to be honest with you, but I'm gonna be respectful to you, okay? So your 17 month old boy is not bad, but they are making hurtful choices or choices that are frustrating to you. But no child is actually bad. They're just making choices that are not acceptable. Um, but all children want to be good or be helpful and be seen that way. So you want to take away that language of good and bad. I use helpful or hurtful. 
Um, and it's about the choice, not about them. They are not a bad human being. They just made a hurtful choice or they made a mistake. Um, at 17 months, he's really exploring what he's allowed and not allowed to do. So if he cries until he gets his way, which he always does, that means that you're telling him that when he cries for long enough, you will give him his way. So part of that is that he, you kind of taught him that if he cries for long enough, you will give him what he was hoping for, which is hard to accept as an adult because we get to a point where we're so frustrated where we're like, fine, have it, right? Because we created this power struggle. So instead, you can stop and take a breath and say, you wanted that. Yeah, you wanted that. This is hard. I'm here. You wanted that. It's not a choice right now. You can have this or that. And they might swat at you or say, no, I hear you. It is hard to not have something that you really, really want. Take a deep breath when you're ready. I'm here for you. You're safe. And then just be their calm person. Because if you're not calm, they're going to continue crying. There's this thing called mirror neurons. And especially for young, young kiddos like that, if you are stressed or anything, it kind of comes off into the environment and they pick up on that stress. That's why stressed parents, when they're like trying to rock a baby to sleep, if they're really stressed out, the baby continues crying because they feel the stress. Um, it's the same as like if you were to walk into a room and you feel the tension, even though you have no idea what just happened, but you can feel it. And maybe you were having a great day, but then all of a sudden you're like, ooh, you know, it ruins that for you. And you all of a sudden are not as excited about your day because you walked into this like heavy feeling. Um, so it's the same for your 17 month old too. Make sure that you are showing calm and being calm for them. And eventually it will help maintain eye contact, take deep breaths. Even if they don't do them with you right away, it will help to calm them down. Um, but the hardest part about that is being reflective about what you may or may not have done to help the situation or to create a worse situation, unfortunately. And all of us are guilty of it. It happens. Um, so my thing is, if he cries to get his way, you're going to empathize and say, you know, I hear you. This is hard. But you're not going to say, yep, this is hard for you. It's you have to actually feel that because everyone's been in a place where something was hard for them and they wish they didn't have to deal with it. So make sure you can be there in that place with them. You really wanted that. Yeah. Do you want a hug? You know, things like that. It's not giving in because they still didn't get what they were hoping for. Or, you know, they may still have to wait for it. But there is no power struggle. It's just you are allowing them to feel that. And the crying will last less time. It will not last for as long. Over time, it'll take a few days of realizing, you know, every time I do this, I'm not going to get what I'm hoping for. So they're going to learn a new way to try to get what they were hoping for, which will mean taking those deep breaths, getting that positive attention from you, which they may need, and then waiting or, you know, taking one of those other choices. Those are the skills you're going to teach them by being their calm person and offering up those options. Um, and that's reteaching the skill in a positive way. All right, guys, I appreciate your time and I appreciate your support.